Well, good morning. It is great to welcome you to uh, Christchurch Stockport uh, online this morning. Everything that you're going to need for today's service should come up on the screen uh, in front of you. But if you'd rather have a printable version, uh, then you can head over to our Facebook group, Christchurch uh, Stockport on Facebook, and you'll be able to sign up there to the group uh, and download a printable version of, of all the words that you're going to need for today. Uh, and also you'll find some children's activities uh, there that you can use uh, if indeed you have children. Uh, well, we're continuing our Mission Impossible series this morning, looking through the book of Acts uh, to see how God, through his spirit, uh, equipped and emboldened and led his church in their mission to take the gospel out from Jerusalem uh, to the ends of the earth. Uh, and this is what the Apostle Paul tells us about that gospel. Uh, he says in uh, the first chapter of Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. We have a God of salvation and a message of power. And so as we begin our time together, let's rejoice in the God who is worthy of our praise. And stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise. Yeah. 
Well, we've just sung of the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love, a God who comes down to find us and to bring us uh, his salvation. And yet so often, as we were hearing last week, we reject his coming, don't we? Uh, We live as if he doesn't exist. We scorn his rescue and we live our lives as if we were God and, and he is not. And so as we heard last week from Acts chapter 3, as Peter tells us, we must repent so that our sins may be blotted out. We must turn back to our Lord God and seek his forgiveness, which is what we're going to do now through the words of our confession, knowing that as we do, because Jesus died, God can and will forgive us our sins. So what we're going to do is if you just take a moment Uh, to reflect about what it is you need to bring before the Lord and seek his forgiveness for this week. Uh, And then after a a moment's silence, what we'll do is I'll I'll read the prayer. uh, And each time I get to Lord be merciful, uh, if you'll join uh, in with the words, forgive us our sin. So let's just take a moment to reflect on what it is we need to bring before the Lord uh, this week. together. Lord God, our maker and our redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our hearts, nor our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. Amen. Well, may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Salvation
Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we live in a country where we're able to worship you, where we're able to follow you and have our faith and be able to proclaim that. Lord, as the world becomes a small place, we realise the difficulties that others have and the persecution that they face for following you. Lord, I thank you for the recent news about the two new Amy church plants, the one in Hull and the one in Lymington. Lord, I pray that the planters are able to go out into those new communities that they can find and support those communities and that the individuals there are led to you. Lord, I pray that you're in their hearts and you're at the forefront of everything that they do. Lord, I pray for our partners. I pray for the partner churches that we have around the world, whether that be in the United States, whether that be in Sweden, or whether that be um, just across the hills in Yorkshire. Lord, at this difficult time for churches, I pray that those churches and those members of churches are able to worship you and they're able to find fellowship with each other, however that may happen. Lord, I pray for the members of our church whether they're experiencing illness, whether they're experiencing anxiety, whether they have members of their family who are doing the same. Lord, I pray that, again, you are in their hearts and that you are in their thoughts, whatever they may be going through. Lord, I pray for our community. I pray for... Um, our schools, which have gone back recently. I pray for the children that are there and the new experiences and the difference that they're having to adapt to. I pray for the teachers and the management of those schools as they make difficult and hard decisions at times. I pray for the people that may be returning to work, whether that be them returning from furlough or whether that be returning to the workplace after working from home. Both those things will be huge changes and the feelings, the anxiety for some will be great. Lord, I pray that you are in their hearts. Lord, I pray for the decision makers of our country and our elected officials. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom. I pray that they are making decisions for the best of all of us and that they can help guide us through this difficult situation. And finally, Lord, I pray that all of us have faith and have our trust in you. That as we go through these difficult and unprecedented times where we don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next, Lord, I pray that we're able to support each other, that we're able to have fellowship with each other, and we're able to pray for each other. And Lord, that we know that you are with us and we have trust in you. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, welcome back to our new City Catechism series, where we look at big truths from the Bible. Over the last few weeks, we were reading and learning about a redeemer, 
from what that was and who that was. And we're going to look at that a bit more today with our question number 21. What sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? Remember, a redeemer is someone who swaps or exchanges something for us. We are sinful and we deserve to be punished. And in our question 19, we learnt that the only redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he swapped his life with ours so that we didn't need to be punished. He is our redeemer. So could anyone be a redeemer? Does it have to be Jesus? Could, it, could our punishment have been swapped by anyone? No. What is the sort of redeemer needed to bring us back to God? One who is truly human and truly God. One who is truly human and truly God. So you're human. I'm a human and we're fully human, but Jesus is fully human and fully God at the same time. It's quite hard for us to get our heads around and to understand, but in the Bible, it tells us that this is true, that Jesus is truly human and truly God. In the book in the Bible called Luke, it tells us that Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. So Jesus was born on this earth, he's fully human. And later on in that book in the Bible and in other gospels, we can read more about Jesus's life. And actually we read that he did miracles and he could do so much more than any human could. And so he was fully God at the same time. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look a bit more at what that means and what that looks like. But for this week, what sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? One who is truly human and is truly God. Everything about a human person and everything about God are met in Jesus. See you next week. Well, thanks, Jane and Alex. Uh, we've spoken to God in prayer and now we're going to listen to him as we hear the Bible read uh, and taught. So won't you please turn in your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 4 and when you found it I'm going to read uh, from verse 1 all the way through to verse 31 uh, before I hand over to John who will come uh, and explain it to us. Acts chapter 4 uh, and we'll begin to read at verse 1. I'll just give you a moment to find it. read together Acts chapter 4 uh, and as they were speaking to the people the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of men came to about 5,000 on the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognised that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? 
for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. But the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly, in this city there were gathered against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, Look upon their threats and grant to you, your servants, to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. John, uh, come and teach us uh, what this means. Well, good morning. I hope this video finds you safe and well. Before we start, let us pray together. Father God, this morning we are considering the reality, the authority of Jesus. So we ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that through your word, we would hear and see the risen Lord Jesus today. Amen. Well, we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. As a church, we regularly come back to the book of Acts because it reminds us of our mission and purpose as a church, as we play our part in God's mission of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. As Matt reminded us last week, the book of Acts in many ways is our history. It's where we as a church trace our beginnings. But that's not to say that its lessons are constrained to history, not least because the culture surrounding the early church was in many ways similar to the culture that surrounds us today. You see, the Greco-Roman world, much like 21st century Britain, was a complicated mix of the sceptical and the superstitious, of the sacred and the secular. It was a world of many gods and none, of philosophical and religious pluralism. It was a world of tolerance for those who accepted the status quo, but of persecution for all those who dared to be different. It was a world where the exclusive claims of Jesus were just as radical, just as divisive, just as incendiary as they are today. And yet it was in this aggressively anti-Christian environment that the early church took root and grew. So it's helpful for us to think then through what made those early Christians, the, the early church, dare to be different in that context. What convinced them to be countercultural, to count the cost and stand up for Jesus? What was it, for example, that convinced 5,000 to join the ranks of this marginalised movement the last time out? What is it that's going to make us stand up and be counted for Jesus today? Well, this particular bit of Acts that we're looking at gives us a brilliant insight into why so many were convinced to follow Jesus. So last time out in chapter 3, we heard how Peter had healed a lame beggar who was sat outside the temple gates. And as the crowds gathered round to catch a glimpse of this incredible miracle, Peter told them to, to not look at him, but instead he pointed towards Jesus, telling the whole crowd that they should all repent of their ignorance and sin and turn back to God. But as Peter concluded his speech at the beginning of chapter 4, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees arrived to find out what on earth was going on. Now, interestingly, they didn't deny that a miracle had taken place. They weren't worried that the people had gathered to witness it. They didn't even balk at Peter's assertion of their complicity in the arrest, trial and death of Jesus. Now, what got their goat, chapter 4, verse 2, 
was that Peter had dared to teach the people. And worse still, he dared to teach them about the resurrection from the dead. Now, it's probably worth just saying something here about the Sadducees to understand this reaction. So the Sadducees were an uber-religious, ultra-orthodox sect of Judaism who would assume the role of religious and political leaders of Israel. Unsurprisingly, most of the priests serving in the temple were Sadducees, and the captain of the temple guard and the high priest were all high-ranking members. Now, in terms of their specific beliefs, the Sadducees rejected what they considered to be the vain hope of a coming Messiah, since, as they believed, the age of God's promise had begun a century or so earlier with the Maccabean Revolt, and was continuing to that day under their supervision. To them, the Messiah was just an ideal, a motif, not an actual person. And therefore, without a physical king, the kingdom of God, well, it just became theirs to rule. Pragmatically also, denying a Messiah also suited them politically, because it allowed them to toe the party line with Rome, to maintain a status quo, assuring their tolerated status within the Greco-Roman culture. Yet by dispensing of the necessity of a Messiah, of a, of a saviour, by simply reducing the kingdom of God down to a matter of earthly ge geopolitics, the Sadducees had also surrendered a belief in the resurrection from the dead. They'd come to believe that the soul died with the body and there was no afterlife. There was no promise of a future eternity. That's why they were sad, you see. Sorry about that. Joking apart, though, you can see now why, on hearing Peter's address, they were greatly annoyed. Consequently, they arrested both Peter and John and held them in custody overnight. And we pick up the story this morning, the following day, in chapter 4, verse 5. So look with me at verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? According to the temple traditions, the Sadducees graciously out Peter and John a fair trial. So they asked, by what power or by what name did you do this? In other words, who gave you permission to do and say these things? Who gave you license to make these ridiculous claims? By whose authority are you acting? Now, this question of authority is actually really helpful as we seek to understand the expansion and explosion of the early church. In fact, it's a question that's still important for us to wrestle with today. Because behind every decision we make, every choice, every action, there is a power or a name that we are obeying. Everything we do is influenced by some authority. Now, it might be internal or external. It could be explicit or implicit. But nevertheless, everything we do is influenced by authority. Now, the vast majority of human influences all boil down to simply one of two sources. They're either what I'm going to call individual or institutional authorities. So individual authority, it's very popular in the secular West, is basically where our choices and decisions are influenced by our own experience, ethics or emotions. The individual gets to decide what works best for them, what gives them the most benefit, what gives them the most satisfaction. They are their own authority. Now, the obvious issue with this, though, is who decides which individual authority takes precedence? How do I know if my experience or views or feelings are more important or, or more valid than yours? Do you see the problem? There's no way of telling. It's just all relative and subjective. On the other hand, there is institutional authority, far more popular in the ancient world, where decisions are influenced by the preferences, procedures and precepts of whichever particular social construct, be it the family, philosophy, government or religious denomination. The issue here, though, is who decides what is best for the particular institution or what is best for the individuals within that group. It's still all relative and subjective. And a further problem with institutional authority, as many are finding out in this current season of coronavirus, is the reality that we'll only really listen to and obey an institution to the extent that we trust that its ideas and ideals are beneficial, equitable and apply to all. 
But then there's another type of authority, one so influential that realistically you have no choice but to respond. For the sake of symmetry, I'm going to call this intrinsic authority. Where actually it's not so much a question of choice, but of compulsion. Simply responding to fundamental, objective reality. Now, it's really hard to illustrate this, but let me try to give you an example. If I was to jump out of a tree, it doesn't matter what I personally think or feel. It doesn't matter what my family or my philosophy has taught me. No, the simple reality is, if I jump out of a tree, I must obey the laws of physics and come crashing to the ground. Now, the thing is, we don't often encounter this kind of authority in any of our human relationships, spheres or structures, which is why it's so hard for me to illustrate. There is next to nothing in our experience that simply compels us to act. There is very little that demands a response like this. Sure, dictators like to think they wield this kind of power, but in actuality, theirs is nothing more than an institutional power by force. And yet it is to a compelling, intrinsic authority like this that Peter points to in his response to the Sadducees. Look what he says in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. In other words, the authority, the power, the name by which this man stands before you now is Jesus Christ, whose name literally means, brace yourselves, Sadducees, the Messiah, the one whom you killed and yet God raised from the dead. His reality is all the permission and license we need. Peter's saying to the Sadducees, look, look, this isn't something that I've just made up. It isn't something that I just feel strongly. It's not me expressing my inalienable right to my own beliefs. And neither is it something that I've picked up in a tract or classroom or seminary. No, this is the inescapable, incontrovertible, inevitable Son of God. And in his name and by his authority, we are compelled to speak and do these things. Now, I guess it's fairly unlikely that we'll ever find ourselves in a position like Peter and John. People rarely would ask us as Christians today, by what power or by what name do we make the claims of Christianity? But people do say things like, what gives you the right to make this claim? Or what gives Christians the right to hold this particular view in contrary to popular opinion? What is your authority? Well, Peter has shown us here that being a disciple of Jesus simply isn't personal choice or preference. Jesus is not simply the best of a bunch of different religious leaders or experiences. Neither is the church the, the most powerful or most influential institution. No. No. We say and do these things. We hold on to and hold out the truth of the gospel simply because of Jesus, because of who he is and what he has done. He is our reality. He is fundamental reality. Look at verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else for the no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Our authority comes from Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. And whilst he was rejected by the religious leaders of Israel, as the true sovereign authority of the universe, God made him the rock, the foundation, the, the cornerstone. And therefore there is no other name, no other power, no other authority by which we can be saved. Now, to our modern Western culture, this is a shocking claim. It is offensive to say something like this. How dare you say that there is no other name, that there is no other way to salvation? But it's comforting, comforting for us to know today as the church that it was no less shocking back then. So remember, to claim exclusivity in a Greco-Roman world was a recipe for persecution. And more than that, the fact that Peter issued this statement in the temple courts is massively significant because these two claims 
that, that Jesus is God proved by the resurrection and that he is the Messiah, the Saviour, the only Saviour, verse 12. Well, they were particularly difficult for the Jews to accept. Because outside of Judaism, in ancient Western religion, you generally had polytheism. That is, many gods, so many gods, local gods and national gods, gods of this, that and the other. And therefore, the possibility of a god becoming man, well, it was kind of accepted. After all, they had demigods and heroes like Achilles and Hercules, men who had godlike qualities. On the other hand, in ancient Eastern religion, you have pantheism. That is, that God is everywhere and in everything. So again, the, the likelihood of a God becoming human would not be, on, be beyond the realms of possibility. But, but Judaism was the first truly monotheistic religion. And therefore, there was no room, absolutely no way in Jewish thought, that, that God would ever become a man. It couldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. You then add it in the Sadducees' unbelief in final judgment and the afterlife. And you can see just how impossible, how implausible, how improbable that any right-minded Jewish person would ever believe in the claims of Jesus. And yet believe in him, they did. 5,000 we heard about last week. All I'm trying to say is that if you put the early church's growth down to primitive ignorance or, or blind acceptance, then understand that everything in Jewish culture was biased against a belief in a risen Lord. And everything in Greco-Roman culture was biased against an exclusive sovereign saviour. But despite these massive cultural hurdles, many were convinced convinced by the evidence, compelled by the reality, simply responding to the intrinsic authority of Jesus Christ. That's making me wonder that as we seek to make disciples in this 21st century, if we need to go back and reclaim or, or really take hold of this reality, that the claims of Jesus are, not, are just as incredible, just as inexplicable to our modern ears, and yet will not win people to Christ simply by presenting the most coherent arguments or the most consistent regimes. No, as important as these things may be, people will only ever be won by encountering the reality, the fundamental reality of the risen Jesus. So like Peter, our job is not to present a philosophical viewpoint or an effective system or, or a lifestyle choice, but instead to proclaim a person the person of Jesus Christ. He is the power. He is the name. He is the authority. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Brothers and sisters, we've, we've been called and compelled to present Jesus, to proclaim Jesus, to point and introduce people to Jesus. As the famous preacher Spurgeon once quipped, defending Jesus is like defending a lion. He doesn't really need our help. We just need to let him loose. But actually, what is really shocking in the following verses is that it's not that the Sadducees then go on to give a compelling counter-argument or counter-proof to Peter's claims about Jesus. No, they accepted that the reality of Jesus was way beyond their ability to control or, or, or their authority. But instead of engaging with or, or recognising the claims of Jesus... They simply go on to try and silence the apostles. Verse 16, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Don't know, but as, as I hear that, it sounds a lot like the modern solution of council culture, doesn't it? If you can't argue with them, if you, if you can't reason with them, if you can't beat them, well then intimidate them, harass them, no platform them. But as we've come to see for Peter and John, Jesus is inevitable. He is the ultimate authority to be obeyed and consequently they're not swayed by this institutional influence. They're not concerned by cancel culture or, or losing their platform. Their response to the Sadducees actually is brilliant, verse 19. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. In other words, we'll leave it to you to decide whether obeying your authority is more pressing or more important than obeying God's authority. 
But while you're busy working that out, we're going to continue to speak of Jesus, to speak of what we've seen and heard about Jesus. You know, this is another great lesson that perhaps we need to take heed of today. Because there will come a time, and I believe it will come sooner rather than later, where as Christians, our views, our opinions, our assertions, they'll not just be unpopular. They'll not just be lampooned on social media. But there'll come a time when we will feel the full force of cancel culture. Like Peter and John, we need to be ready to stand firm and obey God, whatever the consequences. People may disagree with us. People may seek to marginalise us. But as Peter says, well, that's up for them to decide. We cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. And most of all, we don't need others' permission or authority to speak of Jesus. We have his authority. Do you remember Matthew 28, verse 18? Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We cannot but speak of Jesus. We cannot but hold on to and hold out the good news of Jesus to let the, the gospel lion out of his cage. Look, it might not win us friends in high places, but as history shows, it will convince others of the reality and the authority of Jesus. But clearly this kind of stance requires guts. It requires boldness. And it'd be all too easy to assume that, that Peter and John were a bit like the SAS of the early church, you know, hard as nails, not affected by anything or anyone. But that would be a bit of a mistake. That Their boldness was a consequence of their complete confidence in the risen Jesus. Look, look at verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You know, after, after their hearing, Peter and John come back and celebrate with the church. They celebrate their complete dependence on God. The, the thrust of their praises comes from Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm, a psalm that proclaims and predicts the coming of God's anointed, his Messiah. And verse 27 what, the, what this church, early church says is what was prophesied in Psalm 2 came to pass according to God's hand and plan in Jerusalem. Jesus is the reality. He is the Messiah. He is the Saviour. He has been proved to be the ultimate authority by God. And so we can have complete confidence in him. But finally, notice their prayer. It's not that the church would be defended or, or their enemies defeated. It's not that they would be saved from accusation or persecution. No, their prayer is that despite whatever, they would continue to proclaim Jesus boldly, fearlessly and courageously. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The early church grew because it had complete confidence in the authority in the name of Jesus. And in the face of all other opposing authorities, the church, as typified here by Peter and John, chose to fear God rather than fear man. Chose to proclaim Jesus instead of fearing for the consequences. And as Luke concludes this section in verse 31, he leaves us in no doubt that God had begun to answer their prayer. And you know what? The rest of the book of Acts tells us and testifies that the church indeed continued to proclaim the gospel boldly in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, brothers and sisters, Christ Church Stockport, as we continue God's mission of making disciples of all nations, 
as we stand as his witnesses to the ends of the earth, be assured of the reality of Jesus. Be comforted by the power of Jesus. Be compelled by the authority of Jesus. And be filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus is inescapable, incontrovertible and inevitable. We acknowledge and accept and adore his sovereign authority over us. We ask now that you would help us to put our trust, our faith, our confidence in him. And as we do so, we ask that you would enable us, your servants, to be his witnesses, to speak the good news of Jesus with all boldness. We pray all this in his most precious name. Amen. Well, Jesus is our reality. He is our authority. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Let's sing to finish.
thank you so much for joining with us this morning. We'd love to uh, hear from you if you're new or you're just visiting us uh, as a church this morning. So, so do please reach out to us. Uh, you can do that either by uh, going onto our Facebook group and uh, uh, contacting us via that, or you can go onto our, our website and there's contact forms there. Uh, you'll also see in the notes, uh, both on the, on the Facebook uh, and on YouTube, uh, that we're going to have a Zoom call straight after this meeting. You'd be more than welcome to join us at that. Uh, so find out the details uh, on YouTube and Facebook on how to, to sign up for that. Uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, but other than that, let me finish this morning uh, with a prayer. Uh, Acts, <coughs> excuse me, Acts chapter 4 tells us there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that name uh, is Jesus. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Farewell. well.